Welcome back everyone. Today I'm going to be taking a look at this little guy here. The Power Spec Duplicator i3 Mini Version 2 that I bought for the low price of $140 at my local micro center. Although this printer has been around for a few years, let's see if this printer is worth purchasing today as a way to get started with 3D printing. Now as I said, this is the Power Spec Duplicator i3 Mini Version 2. And I've overlooked this for a very long time because I didn't care for the price point in relationship to the small size. However, here at my local Micro Center, it was marked down to $140. So that put it at a price point I think a first-time user could really take advantage of in order to dive into 3D printing, especially for a classroom setting. In my case, I was excited because I thought this could be a great printer for my students next year to do some particular projects. Notice I'm using past tense. While not terrible, there's one in particular that keeps pushing me back to the pragmatics, which is why I say, from a reliability standpoint, it's not going to do what I want and need. Nevertheless, let's take a look at some of the features that this printer has that almost makes it a seal and worth buying. First, the size of the unit is perfect. It doesn't take up much space and the power supply is inside to help reduce the space. The bed size is also good, 120 by 130 by 100. Granted, it's a bit strange in size, but the bed size is bigger than one of those 100 by 100 by 100 that you get for most printers at this price point. It also has a heated bed that works very well. The bed leveling is manual, of course, but it is simple and fast. They even give you this little card here for the proper distance between the nozzle and the hotbed. It also has a measurement on the card so you can ensure that the x-axis isn't sagging and is in at the right spot. Now normally this isn't something I would spend any time on, but the documentation to this is really solid and well written. A lot of times the documentation for printers is really slim or poorly written. That's not the case here. It's very well laid out and helpful for first time users of 3D printing. I'm very impressed with it. It gives you the basic standard tools like most printers, hex keys, scraper, glues, and etc. Which is nice for a beginner. It also gives this little tool here to help you unclog the extruder from the 0.4 millimeter tip. That's something I don't see with many printers these days. They give you a 1 gig micro SD card, which I know some of us are probably going to laugh at. They also give you the adapter to use the micro SD card in a regular SD setting. Another great thing about this machine is that the materials are very solid. The frame is really heavy and durable. I gotta tell you, this little guy is heavy for the size and that's good to prevent vibrations. It's around 7 kilograms, which is about a bit over 15 pounds. It has the standard 0.4 millimeter nozzle and standard cooling fan, so the parts are really easy to find. And they're easily accessible as well. That then brings me to the next selling point on this. Yes, it can only print PLA. So ABS and PETG and others are excluded from being able to print on this correctly. However, there is one thing that you can print on here that's not listed. That's TPU which is exactly why I thought this was going to be such a great steal. Now, it's not recommended for TPU because you do have to make a small adjustment, which I'll show later. And after spending some time tweaking things, I was very impressed. Now, I'm gonna jump right into the biggest issue with this machine and what makes me not want to recommend it for a first time user or school setting. It's the firmware. Wow, it's buggy and constantly causes anxiety about if the print is going to work. Yes, I've seen the firmware upgraded and all those good things, but I'm looking at this objectively as a first-time user that just wants to learn about 3D printing at the novice level. When I first powered up the machine after leveling it, I went to load the filament. Immediately, the machine locked up and the menu froze. Think about that. I literally just started the machine and it's already stopped working. Constantly, the machine locks up. I find myself resetting it over and over during the most basic things like changing the filament or even changing the speed. It's always freezing up. It's not a big deal to hit the little reset button, but it's annoying. More importantly, the firmware causes major issues with printing. I want to go over some of these prints in detail to show you more. Now I use Cura, Prusa Slicer, and Simplified 3D to slice the objects using the same parameters just to see how it works with different slicers. Let's look at Benchy here or in this case, Sinky. This Benchy here was printed using the sample file on the memory card. I attempted to print Benchy on three different occasions. The first two times, the heated bed didn't come on at all. I thought maybe it was an old G-code that was left over before they included the heated bed on the unit. 
The first print just made a mess without ever making any sort of shape. It was just a ball of string. The second time I tried, I started to get a print, but then it went haywire and started to print way off. The layers just shifted for some reason. And finally, the third time, the heated bed started to show and it just worked. And it printed this little guy. It's not too bad. The layer heights seem okay. There are some blobs. The details are okay. Not too bad for a starter printer. But why did it take three tries for the heated bed to work, let alone even be detected in the G-code? Remember, this file was included on the card. That's not a good way to start. Next, let's move on to the Unifix cubes. Yes, the Unifix cube, because it gives me an accurate depiction of this printer's ability. Once again, odd things afoot here. I printed these at 10% infill, 0.15 layer heights, 60 millimeters per second. It had 210 at the extruder and 60 degrees for a bed temp. As you can see, the green looks somewhat like a Unifix cube. I used Cura first to slice it. It's kind of a cube. There are some holes. But there are some strange issues with the object not being filled in completely. If you notice the top here, you're going to see all these little pinholes. I'm not sure what the reason was for those. However, the real Unifix cubes do seem to fit fairly well with this 3D printed one, so that's a plus. Yet, there was something else that I noticed about this halfway through the print. The heated bed went down from 60 to 35 degrees and just remained there for the duration. So I was kind of confused why once again I was having issues with the heated bed. Then we move on to the black filament. As you can see, the machine went haywire and just started to print way off the layers. And well, it's a giant mess. But here's something else strange. The bed temperature halfway through shot up to 77 degrees. So previously, the bed went down to 35 degrees, and in this case, it shot up to 77. Mind you, this file is the exact same one with both demonstrations. Weird. Next was the silver cube, also utilizing the same exact file. It was the best of the three. The only thing that I noticed were that the holes on the sides were a bit off and the bottom hole was way off. It looks okay, but it's still not great. At least it's some progress because the temps remain stable throughout the entire printing process. Now we have these little movable brackets. I designed these for holding mirrors on dowels for a science experiment. These are a great way to test prints because they show the layer heights and the precision. Yet, once again, this shows how strange things get with this firmware. Using the identical G-code generated this time in Simplify 3D, the first time the bracket prints, it looks like things were going smoothly. Then, once again, halfway through the print, the machine started to shift the layer heights way off, and I was left with this. As you can see, it went haywire again. And, just like before, the bed temperatures dropped halfway through. After getting frustrated, I left the machine alone for a few hours and then came back to do some more testing. I reprinted the same exact file from the exact same memory card. In fact, the card never left the machine. The only thing that I did was change the filament to begin my testing in a new color. This time, it printed okay. Not great, because you can see the hole for the dowel rod is a bit strange and the bracket is a bit uneven. Nevertheless, it does move and has the proper articulation. Now, let's look at these brackets I made to hang a camera so I can have some overhead shots. Basically, they clip on this overhead light. I actually printed this four times using the same G-code. This G-code was generated in Prusa Slicer, utilizing the same parameters as before. 210 on the extruder, 60 degrees bed temperature, 0.15 layer heights, using 60 millimeters per second, and an infill in this case of 40%. The only difference was I manually slowed down the machine because as it moved upwards, it made the bracket become more unstable. Now, the first time I printed one of these, the heated bed went down to about 35 degrees halfway through. So the print stopped adhering to the bed. That's something I've seen over and over with this machine. The bed temperature fluctuates so much for no reason. And the worst part is you can't change the bed temperature during the printing like you can with the extruder. The option isn't there. So you have to pray it will remain at the temperature you set. And out of all of my testing, which was 32 total prints, only 4 times did it remain at the set temperature for the entire time. Anyway, back to these brackets. As you can see after the first print, I was able to have them print again. However, look at this one. 
Once again, the layer shifting. It was so frustrating. It looked like it was going to print well, and then all of a sudden, it just decided to start shifting the layers, causing a crooked print. When I went to my next round of filament using the same exact G-code, it avoided using the layer shifting, but the quality wasn't great because it's really not that smooth. There are these weird banding issues, which doesn't take away from the functionality, but it's really obvious that they're there. Now that's probably something with the G-code, but it's strange nonetheless. However, look at the top. There are issues. In particular, the silver one. The extruder literally just sat on top of the print, starting to melt it after the print had finished. If you also notice, the little nub here that fits into the camera is also kind of spotty too. It's not very good quality. Alright, up to this point all these objects were more functional than aesthetic. So I switched gears to see about printing everyday items that were more decorative and simplistic, like this Gumby. If you saw my TPU video over the Artillery Sidewinder X1, you will know that these little Gumby figures here help demonstrate how well the printer works with details. The same is true here. I printed Gumby at 210 at a bed temperature at 60 degrees, 10% infill, and slowed the machine down to 35 millimeters per second to help to prevent any issues from going too fast to cause shearing on the smaller details. Now it started out really well. Then about 25 minutes into the print, I started to see these strange looking strings. I then noticed that for some reason the extruder temperature shot up to 228 degrees for no reason. At least I could adjust it correctly back down to 210. So he was salvageable. In the end he doesn't look too bad. It's about the quality I was actually hoping to get at this price point. The layer heights are smooth, the details are pretty much there, and it's solid. So this is a good print. Next, I printed this flower vase I designed. It turned out actually pretty well. There are some slight issues here in terms of rough edges and extrusion, but it actually turned out pretty well. This gave me a chance to see how well the machine could do with larger objects. I was actually impressed with it. Of course, for some reason, halfway through the print, the bed temperature went from 60 up to 77, and it remained there the entire time. However, I do really like this print. It's really well done. Now, here's when things got really interesting and it almost caused me to change my mind about this printer. As I said in the beginning, it can technically print TPU if you know what to do. So I attempted to print some of the objects in TPU. The first thing you will notice is that the filament lever doesn't allow you to adjust the tension. Instead, it just has a spring lever you push down and feed in the filament. Once you let go of the lever, it pushes the filament tightly against the gear, which is great because it makes the PLA flow through there smoothly and grips it nice. However, for TPU, it doesn't work great because it's way too tight. As you can see, I printed this Unifix cube along with Gumby, and because the filament lever was so tight, the TPU struggled to be fed through. In many cases, it kept binding up. So these prints are really, really rough but you can at least tell the shapes. Now that's not a knock at this printer because it was never really intended for TPU. However, I quickly made a C bracket to go over the lever to push it down to let the TPU have the correct tension applied as it was being fed through. From end to end, it's 27 millimeters. I found that to be the correct distance for the bracket to give it the perfect feeding tension. Once I put the bracket on, look at how it printed that flower vase. Nearly flawless. It's super smooth. Its layer heights are precise, and the quality along with the flexibility is nearly perfect. That has made me want to print more with this machine because that's one of the reasons that attracted me to it in the first place. And it prints very well with TPU, provided I use this little clamp I designed. However, once again, that buggy firmware re-emerged. I printed the TPU at 205 degrees at the extruder, 60 degrees for the bed temperature, and 25 millimeters per second. It took almost 9 hours to print this vase in TPU because of the 25 millimeters per second feed rate. But around 2 hours into the print, I noticed that the bed temperature shot up to 77 degrees once again. And it managed to stay that way for the duration. Strange indeed. Now, there are just a couple other small things I want to discuss about this printer that also make it kind of a nuisance. The knob on the menu is really cheap. 
it wiggles and causes you to constantly skip the menu you need. It's not a big deal, it's more of an annoyance, but it's still, just be aware of it. The machine is also a bit on the loud side. I know this machine is older and that was common then, so it's to be expected, but just make sure you know that because it's very noticeable audible wise and it will be an issue if left in a classroom or in a room where there are people relaxing. So where am I with this printer? As much as I would love to recommend the printer, the firmware issues cause too many problems. In the end, all that matters is the print quality, and this printer fell well short of acceptable quality. The vast majority of prints suffered because the firmware was glitchy and changed things midstream. Even using three different slicers always demonstrated the same issues. Even the Benchy file that was included on the cart suffered from these issues. From the random shifting of layers to the fluctuation of bed temperatures, the machine always left me wondering if I was going to get a good print or not. The whole reason someone would be attracted to this machine is if they were looking to start 3D printing. This makes the process unreliable and frustrating. Now, that's not to say I would tell someone to avoid this machine at all costs like the Monoprice Select version 2. But it's not a starter machine for someone who's just trying to get their feet wet. It's a cheap secondary machine for someone well versed in the nuances of 3D printing and understand the issues and how to solve them. However, people looking to deploy these in a classroom or makerspace, this is not going to be ideal. It's going to cause many more problems. In good faith, I couldn't recommend this machine for first time users or people in education looking for a starter machine or primary machine. And it's really a shame because the quality of the materials and the ability to print TPU very well just can't justify the constant firmware glitches. I know the firmware can be changed or upgraded. However, most people looking into getting into 3D printing for the first time or at a school setting are looking for the machine just to run, not upgraded as soon as you open the box. While the price point of $140 does sound very attractive, I would just spend the extra money and buy the Creality Ender Pro 3 as a starter. This little guy just isn't worth the money in 2020 as a startup printer. So that's my thoughts on the PowerSpec Duplicator i3. I'm going to give it a thumbs down unfortunately. Although I'm keeping mine just to print small prints with TPU, I can't recommend it for first time users or in a school setting where reliability is key. If you have any questions or comments, please be sure to leave them below, and as always, thanks for watching.